I learned of the fire as it was unfolding. Uh, I was only 16 at the time, but I was out and about that evening. And there was a false alarm and I heard it, but I didn't respond. And I was only a few blocks away when the second alarm sounded and the firefighters responded. And above the roar of the firefighting and the engines of the trucks, I heard my sister screaming. A gentleman friend of hers had jumped out of the window and all I could hear her was saying was, I've got to go tell his mom. I've got to go tell his mom. Terry was named a suspect within days following the fire. And it just seemed to snow. Essentially, the facts of the case were that Ms. Smallwood was home from college for a summer, an apartment building in Carlisle at 11 North Pitt Street uh, caught on fire in the early morning hours of August 29th, 1972. Two people unfortunately died in that fire. The fire was investigated by a state trooper who determined that it was intentionally set and, um, and then ultimately Ms. Smallwood was charged with the crime. I was having dinner with my grandparents and my mother at our grandparents' home when a mutual friend almost fell in the door to tell my mother she had been arrested. I remember snapshots now of the trial. I think the most poignant moment for me was hearing the conviction and utter disbelief. I can hear my sister in my head right now. I will quote her. I am innocent. Terry Smallwood has been um, in prison, incarcerated behind bars since, uh, since the early 70s. Currently, Ms. Smallwood remains uh, at SCI Muncie, where she's been uh, along with uh, another state institution for the bulk of the 42 years um, since the fire in Carlisle. I can remember the first 15 years she was visited on a weekly basis. Then my mother's health began to fail and we weren't able to go as often but all she need do is call and say, I'm hungry, which means she's ready to eat out of the vending machines and visiting room. Today in the, the field of arson investigation, there are several recognized types of fire causes. And one type is, is natural, which would be something like a lightning strike. Uh, there's also um, a type of cause is accidental, uh, you know, an accidental electrical fire, something along those lines. Uh, there's undetermined, which means that the evidence hasn't established uh, you know, natural, accidental, or the fourth type, which is incendiary. And an incendiary fire is one that is essentially intentionally set by a person. But with, with an arson case, a lot of times it's an accidental fire that's misdiagnosed as an, as an arson and nobody committed the crime. And so you get people applying this bad science, reaching the wrong conclusion about the cause of the fire, and then uh, accusing defendants of committing a crime that never actually took place. What, one thing that I would like to emphasize that, uh, that the courts themselves are increasingly recognizing in their opinions and in their orders and in their findings is that there has been a paradigm shift and a revolution in the understanding of fire science. And that change in the science is of vital importance to arson cases. The main problem, the overarching problem, is just that uh, the field of fire investigation wasn't a science or remotely like a science. 
uh, at the time of Terry's trial. In 1972, arson investigation, um, and it should really be called fire investigation because what you're trying to find out is whether there was an arson or not, um, was just very different than it is today. People in the field spoke of it as more of an art than a science, and a lot of um, the training that was done at that time was someone who was like a state trooper would learn um, information that had been handed down from people who had the fire investigator role previously and would look for certain things, maybe certain types of burn patterns as an indicator that the fire must have been intentionally set. Um, that has evolved over the past few decades to a point where now fire investigation really is a science. Fire investigators um, had the notion that ordinary fires, that is fires involving ordinary combustibles like wood and paper and plastic burned at one temperature and fire, uh, fires involving flammable liquids burned at a higher temperature. That's not true. Uh, fire investigators used to believe that spalled concrete, that is an explosive chipping up of the surface, was an exclusive indicator of the presence of flammable liquids. Not true. They used to believe that crazed glass, uh, little spidery uh, cracks in glass, indicated very rapid heating. Not true. Too many have found theirs, themselves in the position we stand today. That our judicial system is one who upholds law, but are not necessarily seekers of justice. I would want the world to know, if you have a family member in our position, don't ever give up. Arson cases once considered solved and closed are getting a fresh look in Texas. Well, this is a story you would expect to see on CSI about an Indiana mom convicted of setting a fire and murdering her own son. Now, 15 years later, arson experts say she didn't do it. A woman convicted of arson and murder speaks only to CBS 21 News. Right now, a Cumberland County judge is deciding if Letitia uh, Smallwood will get a new trial. So in terms of looking at the bigger picture of Pennsylvania and the entire country, there have been a lot of cases similar to Ms. Smallwood's filed in Pennsylvania and throughout the United States because of this acknowledged revolution in fire science that has occurred over the past several decades. So you will see a lot of defendants who were convicted of arson and related charges like murder in the 1970s, 80s, and 90s now trying to get back into court um, with the new fire science and with new expert opinions saying that these fires probably were not intentionally set at all and thus no crime even occurred. Um, and so there's definitely um, a lot of litigation in this area at the moment and a number of defendants have been successful so far. A man named Han Tak Lee recently um, got relief based on the new fire science and new expert opinions in his case um, from a Pennsylvania federal court and the district attorney is, is currently appealing that case and there have been a number of new trials granted in these cases in Michigan, um, also some cases in Massachusetts and Texas, I believe. Do you believe that the Willingham investigation is proving that we have a good process in place as this played out so far? Yes, sir. This man killed his children. This is a monster who killed his children. In Texas tonight, explosive new charges over the execution of a man who at least half a dozen forensic experts now believe was innocent. These new charges are again being leveled against Governor Rick Perry, who removed four members of a state commission investigating the death of this man, Cameron Todd Willingham. And as you'll see, the new accusations have some convinced that the governor's office may be trying to cover up this execution. Cameron Todd Willingham was in all likelihood innocent. At issue is whether faulty forensics convicted the Corsicana man. A report commissioned by this panel criticized whether the fire that killed Willingham's children really was arson. 
Willingham was put to death on February 17, 2004. His last words before receiving lethal injection, quote, I am an innocent man convicted of a crime I did not commit. I have been persecuted for 12 years for something I did not do. Cameron Todd Willingham woke up. Uh, he was uh, at home with his three young daughters and uh, his wife had gone Christmas shopping. This is two days before Christmas, nine o'clock in the morning. Um, he wakes up to a fire and tries and fails to uh, rescue his children. And he gets out. He's out in his bare feet and the fire marshals come along and they see burning on the floor and they say, well, fire doesn't burn down, fire burns up and therefore somebody must have poured flammable liquid on the floor. Even though they didn't find any flammable liquid in the house at all, they were convinced that uh, somebody had poured flammable liquid on the floor. I've, I've read the, the entire trial testimony. I've seen all the photographs, all the videotape. They got nothing. There's nothing that they can do to uh, prove that it was an incendiary fire. But they said they had 20 things. And each one of those 20 things was an invalid indicator. I believe that there are probably on the order of 100 to 200 people now serving time for crimes that never happened. People who were convicted based on bad science or no science at all. And really it's, it's no science at all because there was never any scientific underpinning for most of the myths. Um, they're serving time now and they need, they need help. They need, they need lawyers to get them out. The way my family has handled this is through much prayer. Most recently, with the involvement of the Pennsylvania Innocence Project, we all now have a renewed hope, a renewed faith in the process, and a brand new trust in officers of the court, those who are staff and volunteers. Our trust was utterly destroyed in the judicial system 43 years ago. But today, 